We began this morning with this question, have you ever been physically stuck? And I know there's just so many stories. I grew up in Wasaga Beach in the 60s and 70s. So take a guess what I have been stuck in many times. Snow. As a little kid, I walked out into our driveway one day, and it was up to here, and I'm calling for my mom because I was stuck in the driveway. I've been stuck on snowmobiles. I've been stuck in cars in the snow. Has anyone here, just by show of hands, have you ever been stuck in mud? Whether it was, yes, whether it was something, you know, you physically or in a vehicle, um, again, no doubt, many, many stories. How about this? Anyone by show of hands ever been hopelessly, desperately stuck in mud? Were you, like, worried that you might not get out? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I see a hand. Um, years ago, Karen, my wife, uh, I can't recall exactly when she got these jobs, whether we were dating at the time or we were married, but it was, it was years ago, 40 plus years ago. Karen worked part-time as a nurse at uh, Guelph General Hospital. We lived in Guelph. Uh, I was in university, she was nursing. We didn't live together, we were not married yet. I think that's when this happened. Anyway, she had additional jobs. She got a job at a floral shop and she got a job working as a surgical assistant for an oral surgeon. And do you know how she got those jobs? Because she had two older sisters, and one was a full-time florist, and so she got her in at the flower shop, and one was a full-time surgical assistant for an oral surgeon, so she got her in to the oral surgeon's office. So talk about nepotism at its best. <laughs> but the beautiful thing was, there was trickle-down economics to me. Because of my connection to Karen and her connection to her sisters, guess where I got to work? I worked for the flower shop and for the doctor at his house. So the floral shop, believe it or not, I was in collections. In fact, I was the only one in collections. Can you believe that there are people who literally don't pay for their flowers? It was horrible, but we lived in Guelph, which was known at the time as a mafia town. So I would call up and I'd say, hey, it's Don Corleone. You pay up your flowers by Friday, or you'd be pushing up daisy, daisies by Monday. And they'd usually click or say, who is this? But yeah, that's what I did, Co collections for the flowers. But I also worked for Dr. Chuck, the oral surgeon. And he and his wife had a wonderful big hobby farm out near Alora. And so in the summer, I literally sat on their riding lawnmower two full days a week. That's how big their yard was. And it's also why my hearing is impaired today. Because I rode a tractor two days of the week and was listening to all kinds of you know, music and messages and so on, louder than the tractor, so hearing loss. But I also one summer got to paint a three-car garage, but my favorite job at Dr. Chuck's was getting on the tractor, full-size tractor, hooking up a wagon, and going rock picking in the field. <laughs> we were talking about this on Friday. Rock picking on the, in the field, and it was great. I enjoyed it so much, you fill up a wagon, go to the far corner, dump it in the big, big rock pile. Well, this one day, I get to the house, and Chuck is waiting for me, and he says, Gord, you know it's rained for the last four days. The fields are really, really wet. I said, should I not go out rock picking? He says, oh no, I want you to go rock picking because they got to plant soon, so it, it needs to happen, but just be careful if you, if you get into like really thick mud or, or you know really wet mud. I said, well, what should I do? And he said, well, what I would do is, is if I get in the mud, like really hit the gas and get through it. Well, guess what I found out? <laughs> Dr. Chuck was a great oral surgeon. <laughs> but he was a terrible pedologist, which is a science or soil doctor, okay? Because it happened. I'm starting to go up this one incline hill, and I feel the tractor sagging, you know, burying. And so I hit the gas, 
to go faster, and it just went deeper and deeper. I wish I had a photo of it. Cameras weren't invented like this, cell phones like this. And, uh, and so I was right up to the axles, right up to the axles in the mud. And I had to walk quite a distance through mud to get back to, to the house. And I called up Chuck. And, but, but here's the thing, I was not hopelessly stuck. I really wasn't. I mean, I thought I might get fired, but I, I, knew, I knew in a week's time or less that field would dry up, the neighbor tractor would come along, hook up a chain and pull that tractor. I wasn't hopelessly stuck. But another time, I was. I truly was. Um, it was South Sudan. There was 10 of us, and we went on this mission trip. And we are four days away from Pearson Airport, and we're still not at our destination yet the little village we were going to in Kajokeji, South Sudan. And the last leg of our journey was only 170 kilometers, that's all. And so 10 of us piled into this Land Rover, and that van loaded with our luggage and passengers to go 170 kilometers on roads like this. <laughs> About eight hours into our journey, about eight hours into our journey, this happened in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. Here's the Land Rover, stuck not too badly, but here's the van, really stuck. Even more stuck in the same mud hole. Well, 20 young men stopped to help us, but they had been drinking quite a bit. And so it got kind of scary and kind of sketchy. And what added to it was that we were carrying between the 10 of us about 10,000 US dollars to bring to the ministry in South Sudan. And thankfully, Bruce, who was with us, had this prompting in one of the airports on the way that he shouldn't carry it all. And so he divvied it up to the 10 of us. So we're all carrying about a grand each. And to add to that, I don't know how you are when you travel, when you go different latitudes, but for me, my insides don't agree with that until they acclimate. And so I was raging sick, like going down the road to take care of business sick, right? And I remember the arguing happening, and then I saw it. Do you see that? You see the, the kind of makeshift rope? Well, that's the shortened version. It had been longer, but when they started to pull, they didn't like pull it tight and then pull. They just started pulling, and so it snapped. And so I remember Bruce, engineer, jumps in and he says, look, can, can, can we do this properly? Can I kind of give some leadership to this? And, and so they're tugging away, but then they started, they had already negotiated a price. We had negotiated a price with them to pay them for their help, but now they wanted more because their rope, rope had bro broken. They were filthy, and it had taken a whole lot of work, and it literally got quite sketchy, so much so that our guide from South Sudan told us all to get in our vehicles, and I think he was thinking, if I don't make it out alive, at least you guys can go. And so he just one-on-one -on -one started negotiating with them, and it got argumentative. And I literally listened just a few days ago to a recording I made to our daughter, who at the time was 21 years old, because I thought, at least if they find this recording on my body, I'm serious, they'll know what happened. So I listened to that recording the other day. I'm not going to you know, let you sit through it, but, but here's how it ended. I said, Ruth Ann, we need prayer we need God so desperately right now, so desperately. That happened. And finally, we got out. And then a couple of hours later, in the middle of the morning, three or four in the morning, we reached our destination 11 and a half hours later for 170 kilometers. What does being stuck have to do with Easter Sunday? Well, quite a bit. Here's what was read earlier. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Mary is crying. Why is she crying? Because her Lord, 
Jesus, who had literally delivered her from being possessed by demons, had died. That is not what the expectation of all of his followers was. Yes, he he was going to lead them and be a king and overthrow the government of Rome and they would be rulers with him. That's what their expectation was. But he's gone now. He's dead. And she's standing outside the tomb weeping. She's stuck. We also read the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. The disciples are afraid. They're afraid. Why? Because their leader has been taken and executed. Guess who's next? The followers are next. And they are absolutely gripped with fear that they're going to be arrested and maybe crucified as well. We read about Thomas. Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. So Thomas is doubting. And just as Isu said, that's where we would all be. You say you've seen the Lord. It was probably some kind of a dream, an apparition, but I really doubt that people raised from the dead. I mean, it's just not scientifically possible. And so he's doubting. There's one more. In fact, there's seven more in John 21. And I picked Ian to read that because Ian's a fisherman. Ian, have you ever fished where you've caught nothing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. So he identifies. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus or the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples were together. And Peter says, I'm going out to fish. We'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. The disciples are fishing. You say, that's pretty innocuous. What's that about? They had left their trade, their life work of fishing three plus years ago. They're going back to fishing. Because the whole hope that they had had in following Jesus is gone. They're stuck. In fact, let's review. Mary is crying. The disciples are fearing. Thomas is doubting. The disciples are fishing. (laughs) Crying and doubting. Fearing and fishing. Oh, and catching nothing. (laughs) Doesn't that sound depressing? They're depressed. They are down. They are stuck hopelessly stuck. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? So stuck, you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. So stuck, you don't want to leave your your home, your house, your apartment. So stuck, you feel like things are just dark and gloomy and you start isolating. And by the way, there's a real enemy who wants you to isolate and to get alone and for you to feel stuck because that's when he'll really go after you. Have you ever had moments where you cry? Because life is hard. Life is really hard. Relationships are hard and you've cried over relationships. Financial burdens are hard and you've cried over your finances. Health struggles are hard and you've cried. Death is hard. Yeah, we've all cried. How about fear? You ever been gripped with fear? Can I continue to pay the bills? I don't know if I can. My mental health struggles are real. I can't always see light at the end of my tunnel. What will the future hold? And there's there's fear. What about doubt? Have you ever said, you know, faith seems to work for others, but not so much for me? I've never felt God. I've never really heard God. Is God real? Can anyone know anything with certainty? How about fishing? I left my old life to pursue faith. 
Was it just another high in the pursuit of emotional and spiritual healing? I think I'll go back to what I know. There's not a lot of hope in it, but it is what I know. You know, as I thought about all that and thought about how stuck those followers of Jesus were, I thought, you know, why would Jesus leave them in that state? Like, honestly, he, with them, had such a beautiful three-plus years together. Like, really beautiful. You talk about a disciple maker. He said, come follow me, but it was so much more than that. It was like, come and just do life with me 24-7. What a disciple maker he was. And and how amazing was that for three plus years for them? The 72 and the the, the 12 apostles and Peter, James, and John, kind of the, the close three. Amazing. But their expectation that Jesus didn't set up, but their expectation was he teaches such great things. He does such amazing miracles that truly this must be the Messiah. This is the one who's going to overthrow Rome and reestablish Israel. And we're on the inside with him. And their expectations were to the moon. But he's dead. He's dead. It's hopeless. But why would Jesus leave them in that state? So stuck. Well, here's why. Because he knows they're not going to stay stuck. They are coming out of their mud hole and they are going to have a story like no other. Out of the mess is coming a message. Why? How? Here's why. Because Easter Sunday is about to change everything. Look what's going to happen. Look what's going to happen to Mary. Remember Mary was crying. But we went on to read that she met Jesus. She met Jesus at the tomb. And listen to what she says when she runs to the disciples. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things he said to her. And now Mary is still crying, but it's for joy. She's crying for joy. Listen, life is still hard for followers of Jesus. It is. But when the reality of Jesus is in your life, everything changes about your perspective on the difficulties of life. I don't know what all you've went through. I can only tell you about my experience. I was only 33 when I lost my dad. I was in my 50s when I lost my mom. Karen was in her 50s when she lost her her dad and then her mom. Back in the fall of 2021, Karen had a cancerous brain tumor removed. I can only tell you that God has, in reality, actually walked with us through it all and given us his joy. That's my testimony. That's what he's done. That's how I know he lives. Because he's walked through us with those valleys. And listen, that kind of hope and joy is available to you. Christian faith works because Jesus is alive. That's why it works. And so Mary is now crying for joy. Do you remember the disciples? They're fearing, right? But look what we read in verse 19 and 20. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now the disciples are fearing no longer. Listen, the bills still need to be paid, and the future is unknown, but a genuine believer knows who holds the future and goes ahead and puts all of their confidence right there in God. Everything changes when faith displaces fear. Karen and I have a friend named Bobby in Guelph. And uh, he came to faith, dramatic story. He had been one of the biggest drug dealers in Guelph. Came to faith through his eight-year-old niece leading him to the Lord when he was suicidal. And she led him to faith. God used her. And Bobby completely, completely... (laughs) Um, 
was, was, was changed, transformed. That's the word I was looking for, just transformed in such a significant way and, and just began uh, using his, his business. He owned an auto body shop in Guelph and he would clean it out on the weekend so that he could have a bunch of men in and you know, speak the gospel and show movies and so on and, and just amazing. But he, he hits his early 60s and the paint fumes from the auto body shop were starting to really get to him, like making him very ill. And he didn't know what he was gonna do. Like he had been doing auto body since he was 17, 18 years old. He didn't know what else he would do. And he was a little bit fearful about the future. And uh, so he prayed about it, prayed about it. And one day God said to him, he said, I, I, I heard it like it was someone talking to me. He said, trust me, trust me and serve me. Trust me and serve me. So he didn't know exactly what that meant, but he sold everything. And he just started going out into the downtown of Guelph and reaching out to so many of the guys and girls that he had once known from his past life. And one by one, he starts leading one after the other to Jesus. Now he did say half of them had already died before they had 60. But Bobby just starts serving the Lord and gets into a soup kitchen. And then he's a supported local missionary in Guelph. And then about four years ago, he was running into so many seniors and people who wanted to move their parents out of their homes into you know, assisted living and so on, that he bought a trailer and a, and a big truck and he started doing this moving ministry, but he employs street-involved guys. So he takes a crew of street-involved guys every day, five days a week, but he's in their homes and he's witnessing, he's sharing the God, that, that's his life. And he's now like 73, 74, and he's not even slowing down at all. And the guys who come on June the 1st to something we're going to have called Pancakes and Porn, you're going to meet Bobby. And he's going to bring one of the guys that he met who's going to tell his story. Yeah. But that's how God can take fear and it become displaced by faith. Bobby's a living example of that. Do you remember how Thomas was doubting? But then we read these words, then Jesus said to Thomas directly, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, and I think he probably fell to his face and said, my Lord and my God. Now Thomas is doubting no longer. Some people think that the lesson of this Thomas incident is that seeing is believing. But the real lesson that Jesus taught is this. Believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. Listen, life throws curves. And sometimes doubts come with them even for believers in Jesus. Followers of Jesus have doubts because of the curves of life. But wounded faith can become the strongest faith. Wounded faith can become the strongest faith. Let God's truth heal it and displace those doubts. I have a nephew who has brought so much joy in recent years because of what has happened in his life. Some of you, I know Lisa, Jackie, you know our nephew Tanner. For years and years, he and his sister would come for one week to go to VBS with us, eight years in a row as kids. Just two years ago, February, Tanner gave his life completely to Jesus at the age of 21. Praise the Lord. And there has been such a transformation in his heart. Um, and one of the guys that he's become close to at work, a coworker, is about 30 years his senior. And they've become really good friends, but he, the friend, would often say to Tanner, Tanner, I gotta be honest, I knew you before, I've known you since, I think you might be brainwashed. I think that church you're going to in Barry, I, I, I think you know they're teaching you stuff that's not true, you're brainwashed, science is at odds with your faith, and they, they've, had, they've gone camping together and had these discussions and so on. About a year ago, this coworker had something happen. His mom started getting dementia 
and it was getting worse quickly. And so he, he decided to move her in with him and to see her go downhill quickly the way he did, it started tearing him up and even messed with his health. And while that was happening, simultaneously, he was seeing Tanner's transformation. He was seeing Tanner's, not just talking about it, but seeing the real hope and the life and the joy in Tanner. And so without Tanner's knowledge, he started reading the Bible. And he started talking to God and praying. And when Tanner found out, Tanner would send him, you know, little devotionals to do online. And just recently, his friend gave his life to Christ. He's received Jesus. And you know what he told Tanner just, just like a week or so ago? He said, I am full of hope. I am full of joy. And it's supernatural. Like, I could not have imagined having this kind of hope and joy that I have right now. And apparently just yesterday, they went to church and he wept through the entire church service because it just so moved him to think of what Jesus had done for him. Folks, this is real. When Jesus is alive, these doubts can be displaced by faith. Faith in Jesus works because Jesus is alive. And lastly, remember the disciples. They go back to their old life of fishing, but what did we read? Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. And the disciples knew it was the Lord. And so finally, after three plus years, Jesus had achieved what he set out to do when he met them and invited them into the adventure with him. From Matthew 4:19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fish I will send you out to fish for people. And finally, look what's happening. The disciples go fishing for people for the rest of their lives. They go fishing for people. I got a front row seat to this very thing in my own home growing up. My dad, he put his faith in Jesus at age 23, having come from a home that didn't go to church, didn't hear about Jesus, didn't know the gospel. But he came to faith at 23, and he grew in his, his love for God, his trust of Jesus, and his walk with God. But 11 years later, at age 34, I was age 6 at the time, we lived in a brand new house that had been built for us. But shortly after, mortgage rates went up to 22%. And my parents were falling behind month after month financially. And so my dad, to try and save the house, started working overtime as much as he could. And between the stress and the disappointment, the idea that here's this dream house we had built and now we're probably going to lose it and have to move and all that, and then just the confusion of it all, my dad drifted back to his old life. He went back to fishing. What was it? It was nothing horrible. It was nothing evil. He went back to his old addictions. Back to the, the cancer stick. Right? He'd been delivered from, from smoking, and he went back to that. He went back to an obsession with car races, both physically going to the track, but also watching them on TV all the time. And then back to just amusing himself by watching uh, hockey on TV, a lot. Baby steps away from Christian community. Baby steps away from reading God's word and praying. And then finally he found himself stuck. There wasn't a lot of hope in it, but it was what he knew. And he went on that way for 11 more years. Until he was 46. I was 18 at the time. And Karen and I had become an item. We were going steady. <laughs> That's what you called it back then. Instead of being unsteady, we were steady. <laughs> and so we're going steady. And Karen's parents, living up near North Bay, invited my parents in Wasaga Beach. We were going to be together for the weekend. Why don't you all come up for the weekend? So my dad came up reluctantly. He didn't do church anymore. He didn't talk about God anymore. And he had the smoking. What was he going to do? Because his D 
dear friend, Karen's dad, Clarence, had been a mentor of his back when he first came to faith, and he really respected him. And so he'd go for walks and smoke and all that. Well, the Saturday morning, God arranged it that the, everyone was out of the house except the two men. And Karen's dad turns to my dad and says, Jerry, would you tell me again how you met Jesus at 23? Because it's such a great story. And my dad inside is dying. He's like, no, I don't want to go there. But as he did, as he did, God absolutely destroyed the barriers, the walls that, God, that my dad had erected between God and him. And, and my dad ran back to his first love. In fact, he fell to his knees by, on the couch, by the couch, and Karen's dad prayed over him. And he was restored on the spot. And for 20 more years, he walked with Jesus until he went home at age 65. Amen. Amen. Why? Because Jesus is alive and he came to life in him. He allowed that life of Jesus to be real in his heart and in his, and so he left the old life of fishing. All because Easter Sunday changes everything. I just want to close by saying this. Would you stop whistling in the dark, telling yourself you're not afraid to die? Would you stop whistling in the dark, telling yourself you're not afraid to face what's in the next life? We all have those questions. God has wired us to have eternal thoughts like that. You can have the assurance today in your heart and in your soul that you're standing on the rock. How? A, B, C. A, admit that you are a sinner. That is the whole reason that Jesus came on Good Friday, is because you and I are sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we can't be rescued and saved unless we are willing to admit that we're a sinner in need. B, believe that God loves you. Believe that God sent his son because he so loved the world of people like you. Believe that he loved you. Believe in Jesus. Put your faith in him and his finished work that he accomplished at the cross, that he did that on your behalf. Believe that. Trust that. And believe that he is alive. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and that he's alive. And then simply see, as Izu already said, come. Come and receive. Come and receive God's gift of salvation. The fifth last verse of the Bible is going to get the last word in this message. It's God's invitation to you and I. And here's what it says. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes Take the free gift of the water of life. Would you do that today? Let's pray. A step toward you, God, is a step away from being stuck. A step toward you is a, a step away from despair and away from hopelessness. May each one of us today take a step toward Jesus. Come Holy Spirit, move in our lives today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.